Valx Valley. All right, we have a special guest. This is going to be the biggest Valx Valley segment that we've done on this show so far. We have Richard Cohen from a really great uh, substack on uh, women's basketball called Her Hoop Stats. Now, Richard, before I even ask you a question about what we're going to be talking about, which is the expansion draft coming up, how long have you been writing about women's hoops? Um, well, I wrote a mock draft for the last expansion draft in a WNBA, <laughs> which was Atlanta in 2008. So at least that long. Now, from an interest perspective, is it simply that you were just a fan of, of women's basketball or was there something that kind of led you in that direction? Um, I get this question a lot because women's basketball is obviously a weird thing to be involved in. Um, I, I date it back to a tournament we used to have in London that played over New Year, uh, which was called the WICB, where they played men's, women's, wheelchair and youth basketball all at the same to tournament, all at the same venue, um, and they played on the same courts. And if you showed up for the day, you watched all different kinds. So that sort of, I think that's set in my head that sort of every different kind of basketball was still perfectly valid basketball and all exactly the same. And from there, I, yeah, I just maintained sort of an interest, at least to a certain extent, in women's basketball. And then when it, it launched in the late 90s, that that started from there. And then, yeah, so when you sort of, when you maintain an interest in the WNBA, you become an expert a lot quicker than you do in the NBA, where there's... A, thousands of people watching the league and covering the league so you know if you if you have a little bit of coverage on the the WNBA then you 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 become you know you're you're a lot more unique than you are if you're no, trying and, to cover the men and that's kind of what i was wondering and this is it's a little bit of why we are so intrigued to talk about the valkyries is because everybody around this place talks about the warriors like like everyone nationally talks about the warriors but with the introduction of the WNBA to the Bay Area, I think it is a, a it is a nice little thing to to see if, if uh, you know there are people who uh, want to listen to to more stuff uh, about it. So no, we're we're happy to have you. Uh, before we get to any of the other questions, the CBA and the expansion draft. There's some technical language in there, and you wrote a blog post that helped us understand coring and uh, unrestricted free agency and how it pertains to the expansion draft. Uh, how do you dumb that down for the general masses about how that works? Right. Well, the main way I'd usually explain coring is via the NFL and the franchise tag in the NFL. It's, it's a way to, to maintain rights to unrestricted free agents. And you can do it with one player per team. Um, but as it relates to an expansion draft, what they've said this year is you can draft anybody, essentially any any player with any rights at the end of the end of the regular season. Um, and but an expansion expansion team can, under the rules in the CBA, draft one unrestricted free agent, which means that teams have to include unrestricted free agents that might be drafted by an expansion team in their protected lists of six. Because otherwise, what happened two expansion drafts ago, so before Atlanta, if we go back to Chicago, which was 2006, is a lot of teams didn't bother to, bother to protect unrestricted free agents, even ones they knew were going to be re-signing with them, because they couldn't be taken in the expansion draft anyway. So they brought this rule in for the 2008 draft, where you are allowed to select an unrestricted free agent and immediately call them as what is now the Valkyries, what was then the dream. Yeah, and I wanted to I wanted to ask off of that because it is your article that I learned about. You know, if you are cored twice, that means you could be cored no longer, so there would be no benefit into the Valkyries drafting uh, that said player in the expansion draft. So players like Brianna Jones, Dewana Bonner, I think um, Brittany Griner have all been already cored twice in their career, meaning they can no longer be cored again, which means. Um, they their team doesn't have to protect them per se is there any benefit like is there even a like a is there any chance the valkyries would even 
I know they probably won't, but just rules wise, are they able to select that player? Maybe for negotiating rights, like you get to have that player on your roster for two months as an unrestricted free agent. You get to talk to them, show them the facility and mean like, OK, you you should sign here. Whether it's legal or not is kind of <laughs> up in the air and I don't know what I, I can't give you a 100 percent answer in either direction about whether the league would allow it because it's kind of assumed that the only reason you would take the unrestricted free agent is if you then call them immediately afterwards. So it's therefore implied in that, that there's no point in taking one who you can't call. Yeah. Um, the only real reason or the only advantage in the technicalities to taking a player who you can't call is you would then pr probably under the clauses in the CBA be allowed to pay them the super max rather than the regular max, uh, which is about, which is these, that these days is a meaningful difference. That's like 250,000 a year instead of 215, something like that, this upcoming season. Mm -hmm. um, but basically it's probably unlikely because like you say, there's not a lot of point. Any player who has already played two years under core can't be caught again and therefore will be an unrestricted free agent in uh february january february so there's no point in them becoming an unrestricted free agent as a valkyrie as becoming an unrestricted free agent as a, an ace or a liberty or whatever it wouldn't make any difference i, I like the thinking here though because uh richard i don't know if you know the warriors owner joe lakeup and some of the famous statements that he's made about how the Warriors are light years ahead of all of these other teams. So that's kind of a light yearsy thought process for Bri there. Yeah, let's bring them in and sell them and wine and dine them and, <laughs> and then get them to get them to the sign with us. It's kind of an interesting. Thing. Yeah, no, I have like eight questions here written down, but that was not one of them. It was just something that I guess I've just been thinking of like what. So, yeah, no, I, I, mean, I guess, yeah, there's this is, there's not something this is absolutely something we, that we've we discussed on yeah trying to come up with the the answers to this sort of stuff as well yeah it's yeah. it's on the sort of technical niche side of whether you whether it's allowed and then whether there is any value to it at all go ahead bray all right so i guess just to kick us off here again you came out with two articles last week the first one was on like wednesday about um your prediction for who the valkyries were going to draft in the expansion draft from each of the 12 teams and then you came out with one on Friday uh, detailing, you know, the potential trades that can happen within the expansion draft. Because if we go back to 08 here, it looks like the Atlanta Dream immediately following the expansion draft. I, I just pulled this from the WNBA website. Atlanta immediately orchestrated three trades involving players in the expansion draft. Um there's a whole spiel here, but essentially, yeah, th I guess three trades is what is, is written down here. So that's mainly what I'm interested in is kind of like the GM chess match of like this expansion draft and maybe the trades that come along with it. But I guess my first question here is which teams from your article from Wednesday about the prediction of who they're going to draft in the expansion draft. So which teams were the most difficult to predict to predict uh, for their six pr protected players? Um. The thing is, the the most difficult ones are kind of the ones who don't have that many people worth protecting, where you get to like three or four and then you go, well, do we really care about these last couple of protected picks? Those are the ones who are most difficult to come up with six. But that from a Valkyrie's perspective, that isn't necessarily that interesting, because if you can't come up with enough to protect, there also isn't anyone much left over worth picking. Yeah. From a Valkyrie's perspective, the more interesting ones are teams like New York, where they have a lot of players and a lot of rights. So it's fairly easy, probably, to come up with the first six, but then there's still five or six after that who are either good players that we know about in the league already or have the potential to be very good later on if they ever show up in the league again. And, and that's and that's why you can only pick one player from each team, because or else the Valkyries would just pick a bunch of Liberty and a bunch of aces players and a bunch of the players from the good teams, because there's a reason why those teams are good. So that makes a lot of sense. Now there's one player that you said would be protected, but I know from a 
reputational standpoint and from maybe a teammate standpoint, this player may not be the most popular person on, even on their own team, but Kennedy Carter, I, on your, in your analysis, you believed that she would be protected. I've heard in other places that they were not a hundred percent sure just from a fit perspective. Uh, if, if she was unprotected though, the Valkyrie would have to pick her up just out of the curiosity of, of uh, just because her offensive game is, is, is so explosive. Probably, yeah. I mean, th a lot of this is about value rather than necessarily fit or anything else from both a Valkyrie perspective and for the, the other individual teams where you protect the players who are worth the most rather than if you had to play a game tomorrow, which six players would you want to be on your bench? Um, Carter is <laughs> a, a difficult personality that has had a lot of issues over the time that she's been in the league. Uh, hence why she wasn't even in the league two seasons ago. Um, she got cut by LA and no one picked her up. And then she got back in with Chicago and you could see immediately why people were so excited about her in the first place. She is a gifted offensive basketball player. Whether she fits in or not is always a question. Personality matters for a lot and you only get so much rope even when you're incredibly talented if she's available yes i would expect them to take her but who knows how well it would work out because it's already not worked out great in multiple other places right yeah I, I feel like your theme for for uh you know making those players protected is kind of like you said like value first like core uh not core but protect first trade second so like Nalissa smith of the indiana fever yeah who who people have predict, predicted to potentially go to the Valkyries like okay protect her first and then trade because you have the value same thing with Satu Sabali of of Dallas where there's been rumors that she's going to be maybe moved protect her first and then trade so yeah I've as as someone who likes to get into this type of stuff I, I completely agree with your outlook there so I think my question is um I was uh, maybe I'll, I'll do this one second out of the trade scenarios you presented in your article. Which one do you think is the most likely? I think I recall three of them seeing like a Kelsey plum trade and <laughs> then seeing a wild. Yeah. And then seeing a Minnesota giving up their pick for the Valkyries to potentially not select anyone. Which one do you think? And I, I'm forgetting the third one. My apologies. But which one do you think is the most likely out of the ones you uh, predicted? I, I think the, the links one is comfortably the most plausible that they would because they came so close to a title this year with this same core and they've got maybe eight, nine players that they wouldn't really want to lose. And also the num you're probably not quite used to this from an NBA perspective, but the number 11 pick in a WNBA is a player that sometimes you go international with a player that might never show up. Sometimes you will end up cutting that player in camp anyway, because they don't even make your opening day roster. Um, that that's a that's a fringe player unless you get very lucky. So the number eleven, I mean, I suggested either they could trade. I think they've got seventeen, or no, you guys have got seventeen. So mm. it would be a trade down from eleven to seventeen, or maybe even just give up eleven entirely. And then, so because Cheryl Reeve didn't seem to like her that much as a rookie, or that could just have been because she was a rookie, so she was raw. Maybe say to the Valkyries, take Alyssa Peely. She wasn't part of our our meaningful rotation this year, but leave players like Xander Lassini and Jessica Shepard, players like that alone, and let it, let us let us keep them on our roster and give up the eleven for for that. Yeah, I like that a lot. I, I I think you mentioned it as well, but just having more players on a rookie scale contract versus you know the entire league hits unrestricted free agency in twenty twenty five. It feels like those rookie scale contracts potentially be important down the line but i guess along that same line new york the liberty have this have the number seven pick and they i feel like like the links have a lot of protection worthy players available that you know a lot of those players would do good on other contending teams like a kayla thornton um do you think that that possibility that you mentioned with the links having number 11 and maybe giving that to the valkyries to move down to 17 or just outright giving them 11 without moving down to 17 do you think that possibility is there with the liberty at seven or is that too high of a pick for that to happen i think it's possible 
but maybe not as likely with Minnesota as with Minnesota because that that seven pick could get you a half decent player or could be useful in some other deal somewhere else. Also, New York have a lot of players and might take the perspective that we can afford to lose one of mm. these guys. And then because we've got all of these other ones, we can make up for the gap. They've got a lot of good players or a good right rights players to choose from but yeah they might feel that 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 pick isn't w worth giving up to protect yeah just see that's that's where one. that's where it gets my my mind turning because then i'm like okay if that's new york's perspective that makes sense you know we have so many we could afford to lose one knock 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 seattle how does kayla thornton sound for we'll give you kayla and you give us a pick like then going to someone else's door and seeing if, if that yeah. opportunity is there elsewhere that would be I'm I'm Ohema, I'm counting on you. I, I think you're <laughs> I think you're gonna do an excellent job. But this stuff is yeah, this is this is interesting stuff. So I guess I think I would be remiss if I did not ask this. And it's probably out of this entire podcast, so much good, so much good stuff we're talking about, but this is probably what will get the most clicks. Is there any chance they can trade up to number one and get Paige Beckers? No. <laughs> um I, I think I think the easy answer is no. Um, I don't see what Dallas would take for it, basically, because it's a player that you're not only getting the player, you're also getting the, the selling point to, you know, engage new fans, get everyone back excited about the franchise when you're getting a player like that. It's not quite Caitlin Clark, but, you know, it's the, it's the next best thing. So, I mean, I remember, well, I wasn't quite as involved with the league back then, but uh, the offers that were supposedly floating around for Sue Bird back in the day when she was the expected number one pick were astronomical. People like mm. offered to basically trade their entire roster to get that that one pick to get her, partly because of the player she was and that they knew she was going to be coming out as a pro, but also just, yeah, just because she gives the whole atmosphere and profile of the, the franchise a boost. And so, yeah, I yeah. don't think you're getting Beckers. Kind of to that point, what you just said about the popularity and you're really putting, you know, the focus, you putting the team back on the map in, in the, in the, uh, you know, in, in the local area, there's a person on, uh, Las Vegas's team who is way more famous for how good of a basketball player she is named Kate Martin because of who she played with in college. I, I kind of wonder from a marketing perspective, if something like that interests the Valkyries, I'm not saying that Kate cannot play because that is to be seen. You know, she she played in 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 small stints and the the in the famous photo of her getting the block and her and Kelsey celebrating. But like there is a marketing aspect of this. The the Valkyries are going to draft in this expansion draft almost all players who casual fans won't even really know that much about, but you draft Kate and people will go, oh, yeah, I remember seeing her play with Iowa. Uh, how, how much of that do you think is going to be a part of this this whole thing? I think it will definitely play into some of the decisions. It, you know, it's, it, it's you know, it's a it's a sort of a distinguishing element. If you've got like two of players who are on a very similar level, then why not take the one that's going to sell a few thousand extra tickets or uh, get you a few more write ups in the, the newspapers? Um, whether Martin will be unprotected, I, there's a couple of spots on the end of Vegas's list that are debatable. Um, Hammond seemed to like her more early last season than she did later on. It seemed like she kind of lost faith. But um, Alicia Clark is getting old and is also a free agent anyway, uh, but might not be back or might only have a year or two left in her. And I think what they'd like in an ideal world for Martin, it's it's a very high bar, but in an ideal world, they'd like her to be the next Alicia Clark. So that would be the reason to protect her. Um, but yeah, like you say, she's got a massive fan base. So if it's an option, then I could absolutely see them taking her from from Vegas, who may not have great choices on the end of uh, their, end of their roster. And I'm sure Natalie Nakase has a pretty good idea of, of her game based on uh, being there. Go ahead, Bray. I got okay. So we've talked about kind of like, would this team give up their draft pick 
if the Valkyries promise to not take a player. However, on the flip side, instead of acquiring draft capital by promising a team that you won't draft a certain player in the expansion draft, is there also a scenario where you acquire draft capital by promising a team that you will select a specific player from them in the expansion draft, essentially purposefully taking a bad contract from another team. So it gives that team more cap room flexibility and free agency. Uh, in your article, you mentioned Chicago's Mariah Jefferson and Indiana's Katie Lou Samuelson as players that have a bad contract. Could the Valkyries acquire a first or second round pick from taking these contracts off of their hands? Maybe. There aren't many bad contracts left in the league right now, partly because of the way the salary structure was rebuilt in the last collective bargaining agreement, which means there aren't as many just full stop. Partly because it's about the CBA is about to run out, so there's only one year left on virtually every contract in the league anyway. So at worst, you're having to sit through one more season. Also, Indiana have a lot of space, even without getting rid of Katie Lou Samuelson. So they can probably swallow that for one year and still do whatever they want in free agency. Um, Chicago are basically rebuilding as well. Yeah. So. So there aren't many bad contracts on teams that need to get rid of them, basically, it, which is why this is it's kind of a difficult play to make right now. So so maybe, but there's nothing that looks obvious to get something like that done to take a contract off their hands. Because one of the few, Got few, it. few particular rules about an expansion team where they get an advantage over other people is that anyone they take in an expansion draft and cut before opening day does not count on the Valkyries cap sheet. So they could take Katie Lou Samuelson, cut her before the season starts, and whatever she's on doesn't hit their cap. So they're, they're going to have a yeah. lot more space to work with than anyone else. Yeah, I remember reading that from from you a while back. But um, I think I, I, I kind of want to just expand one more time on the page thing. Not to say it's going to happen, but just on the, the CBA technicalities of... In the NBA, I'm used to teams being able to trade draft picks like five years out, and I couldn't yeah. find anything on the WNBA side on like the CBA. Like I couldn't find the rule that stipulates, can you trade future draft picks? And, and if so, how far out does that go? Do you know the answer to, to that question? Yeah, they actually extended it just a couple of years ago, one extra year. But right now, the only picks you could trade are 2005 and 2006. You can't go any further than that until we hit February. I think I think February 1st is when 2007 picks would be legal. Okay. So, yeah, 2024, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 2025, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, Paige Beckers. <laughs> and, hello. Oh, and and you, have, <laughs> you have to maintain at least one first-round pick in that three-year window as well. So... You can't oh. you can't quite send that send the farm of everything. You can do what we've seen in the NBA where you sort of send picks in alternate years and swap yeah. rights in the years in the middle. You exactly. can do something similar to that, but yeah. you have to maintain one pick. Yeah. Brian 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 just uh. wants to throw all the picks for Paige, but as we're we're watching the the college basketball, the women's season, there are sophomores who, who are balling who you may not want to uh risk missing out on it in a couple of years so yeah uh, the hold women's on to basketball, 2027 yeah i mean the women's basketball i don't know if it will continue but i know in one of the pieces that you wrote you kind of said yeah after pick number five it kind of gets shaky when it comes to like the can't miss ones i wonder how soon that changes though because of the popularity of the sport and brian and i had this conversation a couple weeks ago about who's the most important basketball player in basketball right now and we both thought caitlin was just because of her ability to reach people who did not follow her sport which is very important and i kind of compared it to the 1992 dream team which internationalized basketball and now with caitlin it is like really popularizing uh women's college hoops and to an extent not not as big of an, an extent the WNBA like the idea that Caitlin's rise is going to add and and the people following her like Paige and Juju and all these other women who are really dynamic like I that's going to be a story 
in 10 years that I would like to go back and go, okay, these high school kids who are like all of a sudden, you know, who were they inspired by? It's going to be pretty cool to see. Yeah. And I will say that we had that, we had that quote come out or no, we, we said that before Bill Simmons had like, a, like a viral quote that said the same thing. And I will say 80% of the people disagreed with us because Bill, Bill was on our side about Caitlin and like 80% of the comments disagree with him. But what, who did they 80- have LeBron and Steph and no, KD? It, I, no, I think, I think what Bill said was like, she's, he, she, he even went further, like, like easier for Caitlin. And he said, I think like, if you're under the age of 30, I think under the age of 30, she's the most important athlete in basketball. And everyone's like, ah, oh, Shea Gilgis Alexander. I'm like, you guys no are way. so stuck in your basketball no world to think of like what a household name could be. Caitlin is by far more of a popularity than Shea and, Gilgis and just, Alexander. Just, just to give you a little bit of feedback, Richard, what we did was we took the photo of Caitlin and Tyrese Halliburton sitting next to each other. And we said, okay, who is more famous right. in today's pop culture? It's clearly Caitlin. And Tyrese Halliburton is an, an amazing basketball player. So that just shows you the, the power there. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, okay. It's, so it's an exciting time, exciting time to be part of women's basketball. The, the, the explosion that we've seen yeah. coming through over the last year or two. I think, okay, just kind of taking us back here to the expansion draft and just the Valkyries in general. Uh, do you think that the Valkyries want to open their inaugural season with like a decent product? Or do you think they would be okay with a roster full of young players on rookie scale contracts that they have on the books past 2025, but you know, they'll probably lose a lot of games. I, th- I think about like the Atlanta dream. I wasn't following the WNBA in 2008, but I did read that they had like a 17 game losing streak to start their inaugural season. <laughs> and I can't imagine that the Valkyries would be too happy with something like that. But at the it same just, time, tickets, tickets will be cheaper for us. That would be the only good thing. Well, I mean, you see this in expansion in, like, in, most, well. in most U.S. sports, don't you? That the expansion teams are usually dreadful to to begin with because they're getting, you know, players off the end of the bench on on other teams and starting from there. Um, I think they should be okay with being bad for one season. Um, I think that's their best path. Take youth, be okay losing a lot of games. Hope to get the number one pick next season. And then when 80% of the league is a free agent, go out and sign whoever the hell you want with the with Joe Lacob and the training facilities and everything else um, to sell the place. Whether they are or not, you guys know people like Lacob better than I do about whether they're going to be OK with even a year where they might win five games, if that. Um, I mean, that, that Kelsey Plum trade you mentioned that I, that I wrote about was basically sort of based on the theory that what if they don't want to be bad even for a season and therefore you're you you might even be willing to trade away that number five pick that's coming up in in the college draft to get someone like plum immediately and get a veteran who's going to be good rather than someone who's 22 who might be good in a couple of years or who might grow with the franchise you just cash it in immediately Try and get Plum, and then go and go out in free agency. Go after Necker Agumake. Go after Brianna Jones, Duana Bonner. See what Connecticut want for Alyssa Thomas. The the list goes on about what they could try if they really don't want to be bad. I think they should stay bad for one season. Yeah, I think if they take that route, get get Plum, and and still fail to make you know to to win a championship in their first year, I don't think I don't think Lakeup and company can ever claim the light years. <laughs> tag again I, i'm with you i think i think it's be bad you know i think what's well, the flaw jay johnson class next year and then like you said 2026 let, let's see who we could sign I, do how, how big of a deal do you think like um just like nba level facilities are for uh wmba free agents and then potentially coming here and also to add on that do you think any of these free agents think of like I guess legacy when it comes to like, whoa, I could be the first superstar on this very first franchise that's in the Bay Area that is in the same stadium as Stephen Curry. So it's going to get a lot of eyes. I got to have a statue here. Like, do you think that comes to anyone's mind when they're deciding on, you know, where they want to sign? Or is it mostly like, I don't know, money and, and, and maybe destination location? Um, I think facilities are important. And we're seeing that around the league at the moment where everyone's trying to, to compete and to catch up. Um, 
everyone sort of saying if they are, if they don't already have their own individual practice facility, everyone's saying we're we're building one. We promise we've we've found somewhere to build it, or we're looking for somewhere to build it, or we're breaking ground, or it's going to be ready as soon as possible, or yeah, every if you're not spending the money, you need to find a way to start spending the money. That's why Chicago got guys like Dwayne Wade involved in their ownership group. You got to try and try and upgrade because we've had new owners come in, guys like like Laker, but also like uh, Joe Sy in New York and uh, Mark Davis in Vegas, guys who are willing to spend a lot of money. Um, we've seen Las Vegas maybe spend their way around the rules a little bit, um, <laughs> whether they've they've spent their money entirely legally. Um, but then once once teams start to do that, if you want to want to compete, you've got to try and try and do the same things they're doing to stay up on the same level. Otherwise, you get left behind. That's part of the point of the collective bargaining agreement is to try and keep things as fair as possible. But now we're about to start renegotiating a new one, which may be based more on sort of saying if you don't if, if you're not able to keep up with Davis and Cy, then sell the team and get out rather than what the old one used to say was like, let's keep it fair for the guys who don't have the money and let's keep it even that way, sort of bring everyone down to the same level rather than demanding that everyone rise up to the same level. Now you mentioned some free agency uh, talk, you know, when everyone's basically be, going to become a free agent. The local player that I think people have their eyes on solely related to the idea that she grew up in the Bay Area is Sabrina Unesco. And obviously she just won her first championship. I'm, you know, I, I don't know what the atmosphere is going to be with player movement and, and how much they want to, to move to, to different teams. But that's the one where people who are from here they go that should be the one that we bring back because of where where she grew up so that the the thought of the bay area being being a meaningful place is actually pretty interesting uh for free agency the way that that things work and that would be a way to really compete uh you know pretty soon as well as to utilize uh something like that but um uh, so we were talking about um the gm and 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 natalie the, in their pre, in natalie's press conference she mentioned something of the effect of like a lot of the people that they may bring on early kind of won't be here when the team gets good like that's kind of the mentality and there's pressure on them in order to to be good you know fairly soon and i do wonder if that mentality is going to resonate with some of the star players being that they see this league as not just their league, but also a league for a pos the possibility of just gaining and gaining and gaining in popularity, being a face of a team that is kind of the class of the league from the organizational perspective. I think that's really interesting to see what resonates with some of the athletes being that you've been following this thing longer than just about anybody. Do you think as the league grows, that stuff is going to matter? It's kind of related to Brian's question, but more along the lines of, you know, I want to see this league grow. And I see this team as being one of the teams that can help us grow. Thus, that's the team I want to be a part of. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we tend to hear about the the most attractive teams being the ones on either either coast to begin with. You know, you want the biggest markets for the uh, you know the the best shoe deals, the best other endorsements to go along with all of that. But also, you want to be part of an organization that's well run, that's that's going to be uh, at the forefront of the league, whether it's you know in terms of playing or in any any other capacity. So yeah, I can certainly see it. And I was going to go back to on Beckers as well. The one way it could happen and the one way other major trades often happen in, in this league is when the player demands out and when they ask for a specific destination in particular which we have seen plenty of times in this league that is that is when star players move is when they decide they want want a move and sometimes when they decide exactly where they want to go teams don't always accommodate them but it's happened plenty of times if the player 
wants to move eventually they get their way sometimes they have to wait a while but they usually get it so yeah that that would be the one way beckers or unesco probably as well would would get that move would be requesting it and forcing their way through and i think uh, to, to kind of round up all of my questions here i didn't have this written down but i don't know why i didn't ask this to begin with is that like i guess you did your prediction and i might need your help with with one pronunciation here that that you'll probably know how to pronounce once i'm getting to on there on that list but you said that you think that the valkyries will draft Haley jones welcome back to the bay lindsey allen veronica burton a walk we okay i'm gonna have to work on that one grace <laughs> berger kate martin ari mcdonald u of a alma mater baby jessica shepherd Hanzu, Celeste Taylor, Mercedes Russell, Jade Melbourne. Out of that list of players, is there, do you think, so kind of to piggyback off of the, the Natalie Nakase quote that maybe these, they don't expect these players to be around when it's winning time. Do you think there's one here that, that maybe could stick around? And like, I guess I have questions about each individual player, if I'm being honest. Like, do you think Haley Jones finds it here? You know, a refresher of being home, being close to her alma mater, like being comfortable. Does she find it? Or I really liked Veronica Burton in the playoffs. Like, is she someone who might stick around? So I guess, do you have any, not just maybe who's the best player out of that group right now, maybe they'll stick around, but even just like predicting, will one of these players find it? Do, do you have maybe a certain player who you're keeping your eye on in that list? I think perhaps the most, forgotten player in that list just because she was out of the league last year is Jessica Shepard who is a solid post player who's scoring and rebounding a lot in Europe um, and is also a, a good passer for a post so you, you'd you end up the writers would start comparing her to Draymond in, in, in the Bay <laughs> if, if she showed up and, and started playing there um, but she's also she's 28 so you know older than some of the players that you're, you're looking at on that list, because I, tr I tried to lean young like I think they ought to, because you like we talked about, everyone's going to be a free agent after next year, apart from players that are on their rookie scale contracts. So you want players that you're going to have rights to beyond next season. Um, otherwise, it's, it's lots of gambles on lots of players who might might pan out and might not. Mostly Melbourne's still only like 21. She was pretty much the youngest player in the league last season um, and and is talented, but but kind of, but still raw, still has a long way to go. Uh, Kuwait is putting up numbers in Europe again, but has spent a couple of years with Dallas and again, looks very raw, has always looked kind of flimsy at a WNBA level. You, you know, whether she can compete with the sort of the physicality of the league. Um, I don't think Haley Jones necessarily is going to work out <laughs> as a WNBA player because it's just difficult to find her a position because she's, you know, she's big enough to play the wing but can't shoot and has shown little sign of developing that shot. So it's very difficult to play the wing at a prof at this kind of professional level without being able to shoot. I mean, you see, you guys see that just as much in the NBA as in the WNBA. Um, so then they've tried her at point guard, which she kind of played in college sort of as well. Mm. But whether she can she can really do that either. She's obviously a bit unconventional as a sort of 6-1 point guard, uh, which helps you defensively because you can play smaller guards on the wing. Um, she gives you more length. But yeah, I'm not, not convinced that's going to work out. I like Burton. If... You see flashes with her as well, because, again, part of the reason she couldn't get on the floor was because she couldn't shoot when she came into the league. Um, all of these players have flaws or they wouldn't be available in an expansion draft is is how it works out. I mean, I, Han Ju is wildly talented as well. I mean, I put her on that list partly because, um, as I mentioned in the article, I have to imagine she'd be an enormous draw with the size of the Asian-American community in the Bay Area, because she was already incredibly popular in New York. But I, th I think that would translate to, as long as she was willing to show up and play uh, for Golden State. But, you know, 6'10 centers, 
aren't aren't exactly uh, common in the women's game. Mm-hmm. So she she offers something that is hard to find, and she she has touch as well. She can score. If they gave her consistent minutes and had a coach that was willing to to trust her and and work with her, rather than because Sandy Brondello kind of gave up on her in New York. So she would be a very interesting prospect to uh, to work with, at least on the inside. The draft is this Friday. Uh, what is your process as far as uh, what you're writing about next? The schedules just came out. I'm sure that's kind of uh, on your radar. Uh, the expansion draft, and then well, what what comes after that? Like wh- what what is in your, your process as far as what you're going to be writing about next? Partly, it's going to depend on what the Valkyries do. If there's like, if there's some kind of blockbuster trade to go with the expansion draft on Friday, then I'll probably write about that. But if there isn't, then I've done a, a series um, of off-season guides for each team as their seasons ended, um, and there'll be one of those coming out about the uh, the Valkyries once once they have a team and some players for me to uh, to talk about. Because we'll have a page up on her hoop stats where the the salary sheets are as well, putting them together to show what, what their roster looks like once they actually have some players to, to put on the page. So I want to thank you for doing this. This was awesome. And thanks to Bri for setting this up and, and doing the outreach there. Uh, you know, in, in the, in the past when we kind of used your article to kind of explain what was going on, uh, we've always linked back. So I'm going to link to your website. Ex- just talk about the, the, the sub stack a little bit. And also talk about where people can find you if they want to find you on social media. Um, well, I'm on X slash Twitter at, at Richard Cohen one. And then everyone's starting to migrate over to uh, Blue Sky these days where you can knock off the one. I'm just Richard Cohen over there because I, I managed to beat the other Richard Cohen's over to the site. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the sub stack is, is uh, herhoopstats.substack.com, I think. Uh, yep. Um, where I write and a lot of other people write about women's basketball, whether it's the college game or the, or the pro game. Um, I cover the WNBA and a little bit of uh, international play at times. Uh, we got people who cover the cover everything though. The site itself is as the name suggests, uh, based on statistics and advanced stats, you can subscribe for sort of extra stuff, but there's lots of stuff there that's free as well. And, in recent years, we've developed the uh, the salary database, which I put a lot of time and, and work into, where we are the only place that sources um, contract numbers and has all the information on the details of the contracts that people sign, which is going to look very blank in about a year. <laughs> uh, no, this has been awesome. Uh, and... You know, we are a smaller network than I'm sure others that that you've been uh, you've been doing hits for. But being that like kind of like what you said early on, you know, trying to be at the at the front of this is is kind of what we're trying to do with with the Valkyries. And uh, we plan to cover them all the way up until the beginning of the season and once the season starts. So at some point, uh, hopefully uh, we can get you back and, and talk about some of these things. Brian, they open up against the sparks is that the first the sparks. home game sparks so at home go. already trying to create that that warriors lakers kind of rivalry there right it's very smart booking uh, on that but uh everyone check out the sub stack we'll link to all the stuff in the write-up on uh, on the show richard really appreciate you this was a blast and i uh, hope that we can do it again at some point yeah it's great thanks guys